Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the wonderful documentary film Aftershock. We are joined today by co-directors and producers Tanya Lewis-Lee and Paula Iselt. And I, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the initial genesis of this film, because because Tanya, you'd, you'd written children's books, including Please Baby Please, which in turn had opened a dialogue with the Department of Health and Human Services, who had talked to you about um, working around activism and dialogues around infant mortality. And I was interested in, in how that then in turn led into a much stronger awareness of maternal health within the Black community and became the part of the genesis of, of telling the story and creating this film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for having us here today. I, you know, for me, uh, working on that campaign, when you're talking about an infant's health, you, I, I quickly discovered, of course, you're talking about a woman's health and was really immersed in a world of women's health, specifically focused on the disparity and inequity in infant death, because similar to maternal death, black babies die at three to four times the rate of white babies before their birth, before their first birthday. So um, that was sort of an awakening to me. And then of course, understanding that in, with women's health, black women's health specifically, we index higher in almost every, in every uh, statistic there is. But in my travels, anecdotally, I was really hearing from women in the community because I was talking to women in the community. And I would hear about a woman, a friend, an aunt, a cousin, somebody who had passed away uh, from childbirth complications. And even still today, uh, with the film and talking to women, I feel like almost every Black person I know knows somebody or knows somebody who knows somebody who passed away uh, from childbirth complications. So anecdotally, it is something that I think as a community, we are all kind of aware of, even before we knew of it as an epidemic or a crisis. And and for both of you, it, it sounds like the two of you met and, and then this film came together very quickly um because I've, I've heard you mention that you met just about a week before there was a social media invite put out as a celebration of life for shamani who's one of the the women who you talk about who was lost to her family in the film um and what was that initial moment of it, this maybe we want to try and film this maybe there's something there maybe there's bigger a bigger story to tell between the two of us directing this yeah, so as you said, um, at the end of 2019, shortly after Tani and I met, um, Shawnee Benson Gibson put out a call to action on her social media. She and Omari uh, Maynard were creating an event called Aftershock that um, was going to commemorate the life of Shawnee Gibson, um, uh, Shawnee's daughter and Omari's partner, who had just passed um, from childbirth complications two months prior. And her death was completely preventable. She died 13 days postpartum um, and should be here today. So they put out that, that call of action to celebrate her life and also gather the community to talk about the maternal health crisis. And um, we saw that and, you know, I, I looked at it and I, you know, I, there was like a, a contact there or an Eventbrite or something that was, one step closer to contacting. And I was like, let me just, let me just email and just like see. And Shawnee answered immediately and was like, let, let, let's talk on the phone. And um, the moment I, I, you know, I connected with her, it was like, it, I was starstruck, like just by her voice and by uh, the, by her words. And it was, it was incredible how, um, how much she just wanted to, you know, celebrate the life of her daughter, tell the world about this. And really it like on that call was like, come film, you know, not knowing we, we hadn't met, not knowing how it would go, but it was like, let's just like take this leap of faith. And, um, and then I, you know, I mentioned to Tanya, I, I, I just spoke to this incredible woman, you know, I think this is something like really worth getting. We've been looking for, um, for the human, the humanity, the lived experiences of people, because there are, you know, a slew of articles came out. There was certain awareness in the media at the time. Um, as Tanya said, the community, Black women have been dealing with this for generations and, and decades and have been sounding the alarm, but the media was just kind of opening up to it. But those statistics aren't a film, they're articles. So, you know, Shawnee and her family, they they welcomed us in and they they're why this is why aftershock is a film why it's a cinematic experience and not just an article 
And, and you mentioned that idea of, of the connectivity and the humanity and what's so beautiful in the way that you've told this story is that it feels like we really get to know her and we really get to know Amber as people, even though obviously they're not unfortunately physically present in the film. And I even love the, the opening with all of those moments of home videos and just getting such a sense of energy and light and charisma and, and who she was as a person. Um, and so how did you both go into making this film and making sure that that was a central part throughout the film, that it it wasn't just a film talking about these women, but also putting them front and center and celebrating their life. Yeah, I think I think, you know, when Paul and I first met and sat down and started talking about it, the, the beautiful thing is, is that we both had a shared vision. We were both very clear that we wanted to tell this, this story through people's lived experiences. Um, and uh, after meeting Shawnee uh, and then ultimately Bruce McIntyre, who is the uh, partner of Amber Rose Isaac um, and, and really discovering who these women were understanding who they were. Um, we wanted to bring them forward. We wanted you to meet them. Um, and, and Shimani's family, her sister actually is an aspiring filmmaker. And so she was the family archivist, if you will. Uh, and so uh, there were tons of videos that Jasmine had taken of Shimani and her mom and of herself. And in fact, there was a, a website called The Amazing Life on YouTube, actually still there, uh, that features Sh Shimani and her family. And so we had uh, a a treasure trove of archival footage of Shimani before, and we wanted people to see her uh, and get to know her. And we got a little bit from Amber too, because we wanted people to understand who these women were, that they were they were mothers and, and, and sisters and daughters and partners and part of a community and that their loss uh, was really felt by this community. So we wanted to start with that so that by the time you got to really beginning the film, you felt the loss almost the way these families did. And then we wanted to weave in the information, always knowing that Shimani and Amber were, were to be centered and grounded in this storytelling. And you've both touched there upon the, the idea of information and statistics. And, you know, even though this is an incredibly personal and heartfelt film, that also highlights what you're talking about through the personal element. And so how did you go about finding medical professionals that you wanted to talk to, figuring out what are the statistics that are really going to hit home in relation to the stories that we're telling on screen? And where do elements like having visual statistics on screen that are talking about the rising numbers of cesarean sections and how that influences mortality going to be a central part of the film as well. Yeah, so, you know, as we're saying, the stories of Shimani and Amber are the hearts and the souls and the backbone of this film. So their personal stories, what happened to them, set the foundation of, of what we wanted to explore. And of course they overlap because both the, these women were healthy women in their 20s that should not have died, that had very preventable causes of death. And um, so that's, you know, that's the overlap. They were both ignored and not seen and heard. Um, in terms of like the actual statistics and the information, we did a ton of research. So um, we both had our own experiences and knew our own facts, but we had a researcher who was really pulling all the different aspects of this crisis. And then we kind of decided, you know, we had to choose wh which ones to include. And it was really guided by the stories of Shimani and Amber. And, and similarly with, with our experts, um, with Dr. Neil Shah, who um, he himself is a whistleblower of sorts and has been talking about the high C-section rate for a long time and had, and had been in conversation with Bruce um, shortly after Amber died and was in, in this birth justice movement um, as a male, OBGYN who was speaking out. So he had a very particular and special role to play being, you know, who he was and how he identifies his voice. Um, what was one in the movement that stood out, especially as, as a Harvard doctor. So he was able to provide those facts and kind of, um, we felt, talk to the people in power that would hear it from him. So it was important to include a voice like that. Not that we needed to, but we felt it was, it would Break, give the film a bigger picture uh, for the medical providers. And then there's Helena Grant, um, who's a midwife, um, a historian, a an orator. Like, so she's amazing. And she gives us the history of how we got here because you, know, you can't tell the story of the U.S. maternal mortality crisis without knowing 
what led to this. This isn't something that happened overnight. This has been in play since the time of slavery um, in this country. And Helena really, um, really crystallizes that for us and puts it in context. She's also in Brooklyn and Brooklyn um, is the center of, of the film in many ways. So it was important that her voice was there and we felt having, you know, the, the doctor and then our midwife uh, who we really wanted to um, to uplift were the two people that would give us that information. And, and obviously with any documentary, there's always footage that you're filming that for whatever reason just doesn't quite fit into the final version of the film. And I think I've, I've, I've heard you both mention that one of those pieces was filming with some student midwives and that it was a really powerful conversation, but just didn't quite land in the final version. And so what were some moments that you ended up filming? Um, and what's the way in which even if something doesn't make it into the final version of the film, that it still influences the overall voice and trajectory of the story you're telling? Because every conversation is continuing to in, inform you and evolve the story as filmmakers as you're going along. Yeah, well, you mentioned the student midwives. We also filmed with uh, Helena Grant with some of her peers or some of her mentors as well. So we had sort of the wise grand midwives and then we had the student midwives. And I will say to your point, uh, all of those conversations, I mean, Helena on her own by her, <laughs> could really be a film almost on her own, but I will say those conversations uh, with the midwives, while we weren't able to include them, really did inform a lot of what we were trying to do with the film. Um, specifically, I think for, for both me and Paula, I, certainly I can speak for myself, you know, I, I certainly knew of midwives, but like, you know, getting to know Helena, getting to know the grand midwives and the student midwives, I just had a, a whole new uh, a sense of appreciation and respect for who they are and what they, what role they really should be playing. It was, I didn't know that the United States was the only industrialized country that didn't have midwives integrated into healthcare. And so when you get that piece of information and you look at our statistics and how, how, how our outcomes are so much worse off without midwives, and then you begin to hear the conversations with these women, what they're up against, what they're fighting for, um, it, just, it just opens it up completely. I, I don't know that going into the film, we were even thinking about midwives as such an important solution to this crisis. Uh, so the midwives were very, very, uh, those conversations, even though we don't see them in the film, really informed quite a lot. And one of the scenes in the film that, that really resonated was watching footage and watching moments of a woman giving birth at a birthing center because it's so different to the way that we usually ever see childbirth portrayed on screen whether it's films and television or even documentary you know there was kind of a slowness and a, and a calmness and even just seeing her walking outside when she needed to go outside and get some air and just the gentleness of that was really striking. And so I was interested in, in how that came about and also just the experience and the intimacy of filmmakers of being in the room for a moment like that and the way that it really connects you to your subject in a completely different manner. Yeah. You know, as you said, we, we wanted to reclaim, you know, what birthing is on screen. Um, we wanted to rewrite that narrative that it's not, you know, this um, horrific and chaotic experience of a woman screaming and doctors rushing in and show what like a real physiological birth um, could be. Of course, we couldn't plan that. We didn't know Felicia um, before we started filming, but um, we were really, really, really excited to meet her um, through some of the doulas that we met in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, you know, Felicia initially wanted to birth in, in a hospital over there and she had a great doctor and we were we were prepared to follow that birth. And then um, on her own accord in her ninth month, beginning of her ninth month, she decided she wanted a birth center birth. And so we, you know, our cameras went along with her decision and we were able to capture this, this really, really beautiful birth. I think, you know, from the start of making this film, we always wanted to include and we're hoping to include a story of a woman who is presently pregnant. And um, of course, again, we couldn't, none of this can be planned, um, but it was really thrilling that we were able to show the promise because Felicia is what 
every woman deserves if they, no matter what kind of birth they do, they want, whether it's birth center or it is a C-section or it's in the hospital, it should be a birth that is dignified and surrounded by people you love and you walk there and it should be empowering. And so it was amazing to be able to, to showcase that because our film is really about choice and empowerment. It's not, you know, of course it's about the crisis, but it's about what we can do and what women, especially black women deserve. So Felicia was really, really crucial to our story. And um, the last thing I'll say was that Ty and I actually weren't in the room when, when she gave birth, we had a doula videographer, Taryn Starkley, um, who, who lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she was literally on call because that's, you you know, we, you have to be on call. This is a, a real situation. So um, we all got the call that, you know, Felicia was in labor and Taryn went there and was able to film this gorgeous birth for us. So we were really grateful to Taryn for that footage. I think that's such such a great point as well that you're bringing up about different types of births and the fact that it is such a choice. And even just hearing that initially that was going to be an entirely different birthing plan than it ended up being in the film. Um, because one of the films, one of the things the film does so successfully is it's completely non-judgmental. And it's really that conversation about every woman needs to have the healthcare plan and the birthing plan that is right for them as an individual. And so how did that mantra and that approach to making the film inform a lot of the choices that you were making as filmmakers and, and even going into post-production in the way that you wanted to edit this film together? Well, you know, I think, I think it's clear, first of all, that when a woman is able to choose uh, her environment, the people around her that are supporting her, her out, her birthing outcome will be better. Right. And so uh, I think for us that, that, that's sort of what we, came to understand as we were making the film. Uh, in terms of making the choices that we did along those lines, I think to your point, uh, we were trying not to be judgmental, not saying we were very clear and careful, even with the midwives, as, as wonderful as they are and as important as we think they are, uh, we were being very careful not to suggest that everyone should have a midwife, that midwives are the answer, the end all be all, because they may not be for the for, for someone. And you've got to also find the right midwife, just like you have to find the right healthcare provider. Um, you know, this is very sensitive subject matter. It's very personal. And um, we just really wanted to present the crisis as it exists in the world and how it's impacting women, especially black and brown women. Uh, and, and then we really wanted to make sure that people felt what it's like to lose, but at the same, lo lose someone in this way, but at the same time, how that love can be really activated uh, in a way that can make for hopefully potentially better outcomes for all of us. Um, and, and we just really wanted people to come away from the film feeling inspired, empowered, and thoughtful so that when they come away from the film, they could think about what might be the right thing for me. So I think every choice that we made led up to uh, getting people to feel that way when they leave the film. And you were both talking earlier about with both instances with Amber and with Shimani that these were preventable deaths and it wasn't that they weren't receiving health care throughout their pregnancies. It was that the, when they came to medical professionals with concerns that these concerns were being dismissed, which is a hugely common thing in the medical industry, particularly in the black community as well. Um, and so given that you're not inserting your own voices into the dialogue, how did you make sure that that was also a very prevalent discourse throughout this film? Yeah, I think, you know, as you're saying, not not being seen and heard is is the core of, of, of everything, um, like every either over intervention or not intervening um, all comes from not centering the person that's in front of the provider. And um, especially for black women, um, black women are not seen and heard the most out of, out of, out of any women. So we wanted to really show that, again, those Shemai and Amber's deaths were preventable, that they sought help many, many, many times and were rebuffed. They were healthy women. They, they took care of themselves. They went to every prenatal appointment. They had supportive partners. They had everything you're supposed to have um, to ensure a healthy birth. Um, they were young, just everything. So that 
that was really important to show that it wasn't something wrong with them and their bodies. It was the system that was not listening to them in a variety of ways. And also I I wanted to talk a little bit about filming with Amari Maynard and Bruce McIntyre because I I think it's really beautiful that I've heard you both mention that in the way that you filmed with them was very much letting them lead the conversation, that these were conversations that they were already having and you were kind of in essence following and and just very much listening with the camera. And so what was that, that dynamic of that real intimacy and that space between you with them as subjects in the film, but also how you wanted to approach filming rather than asking direct questions on camera just really giving them the space and creating a space for them to tell you the story that they wanted to yeah I mean this is this is a film that was made with deep collaboration uh with uh Omari and Bruce and Shawnee uh and uh I will say again uh you know when when you're dealing with people who have such a fresh loss first of all just being really empathetic really uh, taking it slow and allowing them to come to it. Uh, And as Paula said, you know, Amari and Shawnee very much at the beginning were very clear when they put that invitation out, that not not only were they having a celebration of Shamani's life, that they wanted to have a conversation with the community about what was happening in terms of maternal mortality and morbidity in the country. Bruce also, once Amber, when Amber passed away, he had a press conference right away, uh, also engaging with community about what happened, why are we here? He asked the question, why is, is this happening essentially? And so the truth is that we, we were following their leads a little bit. I mean, yes, of course we had came with questions, but you know, we talked a lot. Uh, we spent a lot of time before we got to the interviews, really just talking to them, understanding where, what was going on with them, where they were going. The interviews were done. I mean, we, you know, Paula did that very first interview with uh, Omari at the very beginning, um, uh, a couple of months after uh, Shim- uh, Shimani died. But, you know, we really got to know them very well and followed them quite a lot before we actually sat down to have the interview. So we kind of already knew them, knew where they were going. And of course, uh, you know, uh, allowed them, you know, what else do you guys want to say? What what is it that you want to say? You've chosen to be in this film. You've chosen to tell your story. So what what is it that you want the world to see? And and I will say, we also shared uh, a cut of the film, uh, a rough cut of the film before we uh, had our final cut so that uh, all of them, Bruce Shimani, uh, Bruce, sorry, Bruce Shawnee and Omari could look at the film and make sure it was representative of, of how they felt. And um, they did come back with notes. And I will tell you, I I do think they made the film better, um, given their notes and their perspectives. I love hearing that, you know, and and also with documentary filmmaking as a whole, it's such a, a living, breathing entity. When you start making a documentary film, you have an idea of where it's potentially going to go in the story you're telling. But there's so many instances where it's living and breathing throughout that process and continuing to evolve. And so how would you say that the trajectory of the film towards what it's ended up being in its final version um, evolved or grew from that first idea along the way? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, it's it's both. Like, I, I think if we really remain true to our initial vision of centering the lived experiences. So in that respect, um, that didn't change. That, that, that was our focus and our guiding light were Shamani and Amber and their families. And, and that was, and that was always there. I think in terms of Everything else, you know, um, the other stories, as you mentioned, the there were the 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 midwife shoots to be followed, other birthing stories that did not make it in the film. Um, we did, you know, we did talk to other providers, but you know, and that and that took a lot of trial and error. I will say, like, there was a turning point in the process in the edit where we felt that our film really, really um got over the hump. Um, we had a rough cut screening. I think it was like in the fall of 2021, right? 2021. And up until that point, like we were, there was just so much information and we were trying to pack it in and we were trying to find our way and, and it was, it was fine, but it, it, it wasn't there yet. And we had this rough cut screening and 
it was so clear that we needed to strip a lot of that away. And again, just go back to our guiding principles of Shaman and Amber, who these women were, who their families are. And we just like looked at each other and we're like, this is what has to happen. And we completely like shifted course after that screening and the entire film changed. So I think we, our vision was front and center, but then we, we lost our way for a bit, but then we came back to it. And uh, I, yeah. But I just want to add to that, though. I just want to add to that. I think that, you know, when we first sat down, as Paula said, we had this vision of the, the this, you know, um, uh, that the film was going to be centered on people's lived experience. And I just remember at one point that we had different people saying, oh, well, it should be this and you should make it that and this and that. And I think I think the key for us in this process was that we were open. Like Paula said, we knew it was the lived experience of people and they were the spine. And then we just had to follow the story. And we knew, as she said, that we wanted to follow a healthcare provider like Anil Shaw. And then we met Helena Grant. And then it was just figuring out, like we had the pieces, like we knew what the pieces were. Uh, and our protagonists were out in the world doing things. And so we had that to follow. And I think that, you know, sometimes you you have a general sense of what it's going to be, and then you have to allow it to emerge. And you can't shove it or push it. it sometimes it just, it's going to come, it's going to, if you trust, it will show itself as long as you stay on the path. That's how I feel about it. Absolutely. And and I love what you're both saying there in terms of it just always coming back to the center of telling very personal stories. And I think that's why it really resonates as a film. So congratulations on everything with this fantastic documentary. And thank you to both of you for talking about it. I really, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. 